Welcome back to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have our short lecture 14 about molecular systems and material sciences. And you will see that these both topics, of course, are really highly intertwined. And in one way, we also have seen already in short lecture 13 before that actually molecular systems, atoms and the DNA and so on, we discussed all in one way related also to this lecture today. We again basically are part here of the second really part of the course where we're basically thinking about much more application areas of where HPC is useful. Of course, these are only short lectures, meaning that if you want to be an expert in molecular systems or material sciences, you really need to study a couple of other courses um, really in this as different area. So the idea of these lectures, of course, is just to give pointers, to give some application areas for study where HPC really makes a big difference. So we, before we then let us basically go um, into the molecular systems world and material sciences after short review. So um, lecture 13 was really then about systems biology and bioinformatics. And we understood that basically the genome and to study really this so-called DNA and the uh, sequence data that we get out of this um, can bring us to a one idea of thinking about systems biology, which is essentially shown a little bit in this video here, where we, instead of having just this whole, let's say, DNA and amino acids um, sequences, which build proteins, um, have a complete view of how we actually fold them to do specific functions in the body. And this was something where we were saying like a complete atomic representation would be probably very realistic, right? Um, by atom type and so on. And then you have basically simplified representations um, in order to get to a much more computational feasible solution here and there. And then we also thought about that um, essentially there are many different pathways to lead towards, you know, specific 3D folds that maybe then really have a kind of verified function or basically something which we know. So, and to find these, of course, are very hard to get to. So how we basically do all the foldings lead to something we call the Monte Carlo methods to really try different varieties very many times through so-called random repeated sampling of the input space, which we a little bit illustrated with the P um, idea of the you know, calculus, which was in this sense pretty easy. Obviously in the protein folding, we have a much more harder problem to solve here. Um, and of course the goal for doing this, not only in systems biology, but perhaps you know, more broader speaking here um, is of course to find uh, you know, understandable diseases um, the idea of combo medicine is some part of systems biology and then also of other areas to study around so that you could find you know, precision medicine I gave as another example. But here we did just one example of this protein folding and these foldings are basically important to understand because misfolds here on this pathway could lead to certain neurological diseases that we know like Alzheimer's. So hence the motivation to study this more accurate um, how actually the body works in terms of these proteins, which are really the working horse of the human body. Then the second part of the, <clears throat> of the last lecture was really then thinking about bioinformatics. So what basically is the role of bioinformatics? Um, if you think about the larger picture, you would say um, it's about tools, techniques in biology, which are really driven by computer science and have a very, let's say, high impact of met methods, algorithms, that simplify many different areas. And one of the things I wanted to basically bring last time was really then the impact of a parallel file system and of a parallelization strategy and something called, you know, basically the sequence finding uh, of gene sequence when you have a query to a particular sequence. Um, let's say you see that here as an example, and you want to basically find the target in the database and you want to see how much basically is this equal to existing genomes we know. And we have seen the NCBI and other databases could be searched for that. But the question is, of course, for us in HPC course, how you search in all of this big data, right? If you do it with a simple laptop approach, with a very small 
let's say, computing capacity, depending on your problem, it can be quite long to search for it. Hence, there are different ways how you can actually parallelize the result. And I showed you last time that you basically have the query here um, to a large database that you can not only scatter in terms of the computing idea now, searching this query in this huge database for the target and so on. And the algorithm of the search can be, of course, parallelized in the HPC machine and finally gathered. We say that also the computational aspect is not the only one you could parallelize on. If you remember, we had the idea of also then have a parallelization of the database parts in the input space where we can say we can also break the database parts you know, into different parallelizable options. And then on the other hand, we have seen instead of doing the master worker paradigm that basically then one, let's say processor or whatever it is, a couple of processors are then used to gather all the results. We can write exactly the files concurrently into you know, disk into the file using parallel IO methods we learned from MPI. So MPI BLAST is essentially the idea to the solution I'm alluding to here that we had the last time. And you see again in this particular lecture how MPI and OpenMP here and there are actually used quite heavily in all of these different application areas with the example of MPI BLAST here, but also basically then in the idea of how we did the Monte Carlo methods then um, basically with the SMMP um, which was then also using MPI and other parallelization strategies that we know. Hence, a short lecture again. The, the the idea is, of course, if you are interested in this field, please go ahead and you know study bioinformatics um, or systems biology in much more detail. But think about that HPC might be helpful in several occasions. Today, we want to rather focus on molecular systems and material sciences, and obviously, as you have seen with atoms of proteins becoming very close to also the idea of molecular systems, material sciences that I will explain today. We will first have some terminology again, uh, again about basically principles that we have already in the course more from the application side, what it doesn't mean to simulate molecular systems and what then the difference between so-called quantum chemistry, quantum mechanics approaches for molecular mechanics and, and so on. Um, we have the relevance that we pick here a little bit um, as a highlight in this particular um, actually short lecture, understanding a bit more what it means to do up initio calculations, which is more or less a fancy word of saying from the beginning. Um, and I will make the case for it later, where we have, of course, here and there also applications from fields um, everywhere. But also, of course, some of them are really infeasible to do. So we will find other mechanisms to let's say approximate solutions that we already know also from other tough fields like CFD, for instance. Then I will bring a little bit molecular docking, molecular dynamics back on the table, something I just was shortly alluding to in the other bioinformatics and bio, you know, biology system or systems biology lecture really. And we will review it this time a little bit also the role of libraries, which is sort of the second highlight of this short lecture 14 here, thinking about that many of these packages and systems are already there with different codes and these codes need to be supported but it also gives you an opportunity to leverage really years if not decades of developments amber for instance that you see here a little bit is a package that exists um, for i think 18 years at least now that i'm in the field or going from different versions of optimization on cpus now being available on gpus being one of the molecular dynamics packages of choice uh, together with NumD and others. And we will make the case basically for it and what all are the unique selling propositions of these packages. But of course we cannot cover all what is relevant for molecular systems. That is really just a short introduction. Again, if you want to be more into this field, you really have to do, you know, thinking about elements of computational um, chemistry, and perhaps then also material sciences that we have in the second part of the course. We do something there if we review a field called computational material sciences and engineering. The engineering here in terms of product development, I put out a little bit. We just make a short case for it. Obviously, many of the material sciences question in the end have a, let's say, new product in mind, which I basically show you a little bit as an example, maybe of molecular mechanics simulations that using the supercapacitors that you know maybe from Formula One cars or from hybrid cars 
having temporary large amount of energy, um, let's say compared to batteries, which we will also will discuss. Then you see here center of excellences like Nomad or Max that we have in the materials domain. There's a typo, but still um, we have their increased resolutions. And with this, we basically see that all of these center of excellences have excellent codes available to really work with increased resolutions. And of course, the more you increase the resolution on the molecular scale, on the atomic scale that we also will discuss a little bit, then of course the associated computational costs really skyrocket. And <clears throat> even blowing that up to have a full understanding of your systems, let's say water as a whole, especially if it's icing, like you know, in the Jökull Salon scenario that we have in Iceland, you have basically multi-scale methods to solve here. You have basically water and then there's ice melting over time. So we will review this a little bit. Of course, think about that material sciences is very huge. I just pick here very small parts. Also there are computational chemistry courses, uh, like actually also from um, basically Hannes Jonsson here at the university or Egil Skulason at the University of Iceland might be then your choice if you really want to understand more of these areas. So here's just a small recap what you should learn from it. Again, here the importance of domain decomposition is an important factor in this particular one. But think about domain decomposition again, not only purely always on the spatial, I have to cut down this grid that you had in the water element of this four by four Cartesian, always thinking more and more also that we have perhaps different scales to tackle in terms of basically talking, are we talking about nano? let's say meter somewhere on the atomic scale, or are we talking into the meter domain or so of a real product? Or this is something what we had alluding to already a little bit in the human brain, right? Where we had this different scales of proteins, the atoms, uh, and then the whole brain at the whole was basically then the synapses and so on, as we show in the video. So here we really are in, again, in scientific domain specific applications, but I highlight here, of, here and there, of course, then, the relevance of the first part of the course that basically is again MPI, OpenMP, the use of accelerators, parallel IO, and so forth. But with this knowledge, you gain understanding a little bit more of a very important field basically that we have in HPC as well. So let us come a bit to molecular systems. So what do we mean by this? Of course, that's not at all obvious for a computational scientist usually. So we have to understand what is a molecular model, let's say of a protein here that you see. Um, and it's basically used to really um, understand this chemical systems in the end that we have, the chemical processes that we have. What does it mean to have, let's say, so-called material assemblies with this many thousands or millions of atoms, right? If we look into one particular element that we have here on the table, a glass or whatever it is, in the end, it's just atoms. Right. And this is the idea of looking more into molecular systems. So um, the common way is really to, to have a more atomistic level description of this molecular system. And there are actually lots of different approaches that are there over time and evolved. And we will review some of them. And parallelization um, in, in a way is really the only way of making this study possible. You will see that by having full blown atomist, uh, atomic stick uh, level simulations it's really computationally expensive you can't imagine and with this we need of course to abstract again we need to do let's say simplified versions but basically they are used in many different domains hence systems biology that we just had in the last lecture is of course related to molecular systems but also computational chemistry a drug design i was alluding to with a docking and then molecular dynamics over time if the force fields really stick to it if you have a potential drug, that is not at all clear. And of course, for those that don't remember any chemistry basics lessons, remember that this atomic uh, representation consists of this electron cloud that you probably remember, and then protons and neurons and neutrons here. And of course, in this nucleus um, that we have here basically in the core. So um, there are different approaches though. Um, you would say they're quite two to just give an example here, which is a molecular mechanics way of doing it. It would be, you would consider a little bit as a coarse granular way. But um, then basically atoms are really the smallest individual units. 
And the idea that you have then is just from atom to atom to understand the interactions, which is then calculated by using so-called force field, which is, of course, now an important part of it. If, you know, basically atoms here bind to each other or so is one force, uh, one part of the question. But the force field question is they stick together, as we were alluding to the molecular dynamics later example is another one. If you want to do it more fine granular, um, then you basically come to the world of quantum chemistry and mechanics. So quantum mechanics and physical models is really then uh, having more this chemical systems in a very low detail and basically have a mathematical description and equations um, that really have the end, the interactions in the end of everything that matters, so to speak, with interactions of the energy on the one hand, but also of the matter. So um, it basically models then even the electrons of each atom, right, if you want to go there. And, and this is something where compared to the general atom level, and now really looking into the electrons of the atom, of course, you have a much more fine-grained solution, much more computational heavy, and uh, basically one way of really understanding then this behavior of this big large atoms would be um, then using the show called Schroeder equation, which is very famous to describe the behavior of such particles, whatever it is you want to simulate, maybe the water particles I was alluding to in a you know, force field. So two different approaches, coarse grained and fine grained, depending on the scale you want to do, let's say, um, and simulate part of your question. Um, it is basically the Schrödinger equation that I want to allude to here again. It's basically, if you study quantum mechanics, one of the first probably equations you go to, where you have so-called stationary and evolutionary non-stationary stage, um, which basically depends on different elements in this, you know, given wave function. And it, you would say this is one good example where you say um, that HPC is using the laws of physics. Right, established laws of physics, which is here one of them, this wave function that you see is really a central equation in quantum mechanics. And um, even if it is just, let's say, one of the Schroeder equation, you can use it in different parts, which is not so important here to for you to understand. But it's really giving you um, essentially inputs to how the HPC machine is now used to use it with these equations. Of course, um, you have to do specific uh, constraints to this. Particular boundary conditions have to be fulfilled. But then in the end, that is what computed, or that is what is computed over time on this HPC machines. And um, by, by doing so, what people want to know is essentially up initio calculations and they want to understand the, the situation from the beginning, so to speak. Other names for this is from first principle calculations. In other words, the equations we have seen or others, uh, that is pretty clear. It's already an established law of physics, but also, as you know, essentially the, the idea how hydrogen or oxygen atoms are formed is also known, right? So this is an example in terrestrial systems. So if you want to do up initio calculations or first principle based calculations of liquid water, that means you need to understand the properties of the hydrogen or the oxygen atoms, for example. And by using then all the laws of physics that we know, right, is electrostatics, quantum mechanics, um, then we can build, let's say, based on this from the beginning, so to speak, from one only one motor molecule, we probably know exactly how it looks like. Then we can put them in a group. And of course, by grouping them, we basically more and more come to the big water that we maybe have at Eucal Salon or the ocean and so forth, whatever you want to simulate, right? In the end, it's so simple, to, so to speak. But of course, from the computational perspective, that's not at all simple, as we just discussed. If you add more and more atoms, the force field will interact much more stronger. Um, and of course, the different molecule types or atom types, really, as we discussed, uh, for instance, like hydrogen or oxygen have all different properties that have to be taken into account. So this is definitely <clears throat> a challenging problem where you need essentially um, high performance computing to do this up in its calculations. And it refers obviously to many elements in physics. That's how we can do it with HPC. We cannot have just new algorithms tackled. Also here we see many packages and libraries that we can reuse. 
Also this we can use in biophysics and bioinformatics where we can do maybe, you know, several predictions about systems, about biological features. When we have once this up initio calculations done using a computation model, but it's of course um, something like we discussed with the prediction of protein structures or protein folding um, that you maybe could use, but it's also in biophysics probably very computationally expensive. Hence we did this Monte Carlo methods of approximate uh, solutions here and there. So still molecular systems and this term up initio um, from first principles is important for you to understand. Let us review a little bit what we had also the last time in terms of the protein idea that I had creating new drugs, right? Where we said the first idea was doing molecular docking. So review this a little bit. That means we have here a target structure and you see this docking of a small molecule ligand here that basically could be now the ingredient to new drugs um, that is binding to this protein receptor here um, could be then uh, basically, it's, it's already very complex behavior to dock there and to find options that it really fits to dock. But then I also said, um, you know, this is we can basically simulation of docking becomes more larger um, when you do it later with all the different possibilities of this target and ligands. Otherwise, it would be probably very simple to do all the drug development. But here you would basically say um, you have lots of these potential candidates to dock. And once you have all of this, um, the second part of it is, of course, in the dynamics part that you want to see if the force field really is doing this. So, um, no, but once it is docked, which means here is now then the area of molecular dynamics, which we do next, but we still see the binding orientation matters um, for the docking and many different ligands, of course, can be docked. And then this is a kind of computational program of complexity here still in a way because you have different legions to the targets you can do that in the first say nicely parallelizable yeah so it's not or embarrassingly parallel it not does not really need hpc because the interactions don't really matter you can do this one by one and say okay it's docked but you have many 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 options of those so you can do this in a high throughput computing perfect uh, point but once you're at the complex area and it docked it, it's not at all clear that they will remain docked. Hence, we do this kind of simulation over time, as I was alluding to, which then brings us into a much more complex area called molecular dynamics, where we really have, let's say, subatomic particles as electrons we were alluding to earlier, or atoms and molecules that are then this microscopic particles we want to simulate. And of course, if you simulate, you have a sort of loot structure, and you know, as I said earlier, with the simulation sciences, that's what you do. You have loops across the water in your assignments. You have loops across different time steps. And here we want to do the trajectories of atoms and molecules. We want to see how the system of all these interacting particles really um, work and how the forces are between all of these. Because essentially to the question we had before, we want to understand if this track is really not only docking, but also binding over longer time and the force field is not a problem, for instance, or other factors. So we get all the forces then after we have it basically in the initial position. And then we move the atoms based on the equations of physics that we know and move forward in time, right? That's again, alluding to a general principle in HPC saying we need to have the next time step and we do the updates of the delta in this time step and then, you know, repeat again the loop and et cetera. It was overdoing this basically again and again and again. We have a period of time that we see the simulate uh, the simulation more or less of the atoms, but then in motion, it's like a video, dynamics, molecular dynamics, not only more this docking thing that we discussed before. Here we talk about molecular dynamics over time and every time step, the equations of motions, of course, and acceleration of these particles um, are basically obtained then from new forces governed by the law of physics. And here it's basically impossible to do that perfectly because it's a vast number of particles. Usually, if you want to just have a one ice block of Euclid's along, we will review later, simulate it. It's like so many different number of particles that you have to do numerical solutions. You cannot do it and solve it analytically. And of course, this is then the idea of the application fields that we see in many of the different areas doing exactly that with the numerical methods. 
um, that already sh already Razor was actually alluding to in computational fluid dynamics. And of course, we can understand now that, of course, also molecular systems and computational fluid dynamics have also something in common. If you think about the fluid flow of water, for instance, if you want to do it in a more up initio principled way or first principle way, um, then you basically have to go back to the atom representation and then you very quickly are in very computational demanding spaces. So we can connect these lectures of applications, of course, in one way. However, it's usually unrealistic to be an expert in all these different application fields, right? So that's why we also here scratch just the surface and would also basically refer to you to any experts in this kind of molecular systems or material sciences field. And before we go to the second part of the course here, ours today, in, in the short lecture 14, I just want to show you that, of course, there are many different libraries around um, with different you know, unique selling propositions. Here, it is a molecular graphics program that makes NAMD quite interesting for the simulation setup. All of them are open source. And just for the HPC perspective, it is based on basically an abstraction of MPI. And it's really a nicely, highly scalable method that you can use today. And I think what is nice for you to realize that I said in nano uh, second simulations are here basically uh, really the time scale, right? When we talk about atomic interactions. So you would say you use, let's say, so many cores, but what you really, you know, and of course, obviously you you simulate like 16 hours. You see here, you break it down to half a minute, but still what you really simulate is then one nanosecond of a simulation. Yeah, so for runtime. And this could be depending on the number of atoms that you have here. The example here shows you it is actually nine, 92,000 um, more or less atoms that you simulate and, you know, compute here in parallel using HPC for large biomolecular systems. And then you understand in that the different trajectories and basically then enables you to study more complex uh, molecular systems. And there are different libraries around. I don't go into detail of all of them. I think you will see that some of them have different, um, let's say, ideas how to do it. Here, the CPMD is really designed for ab initio molecular dynamics. It's also free. It's using OpenMP and MPI out of our lectures in the beginning. It is basically here the example that you see of a very trivial way, more or less, of saying you need number of nodes. Um, on the right side that you increase and get a very nice speed up of this 32 water molecules if you use HPC and you see task group optimizations, different optimizations, which we learned in the earlier lectures of basically here, the, the basic lectures, there you can of course have different scaling which actually can have a big impact. You see here the speed up with task group optimization versus the speed up with, without task group optimization can be significant. So it matters what we have in terms of the techniques that we learned in the beginning of the course that we can apply to this application domains for orders of magnitudes. And the density function theory and for that um, package <clears throat> is really, really some of one of the areas of application that is often used in many different applications. And with this, of course, the effect that we see in scaling and limits of scaling or improvements of scaling are actually an amplification factor, so to speak. You use it again and again for many different sciences. Hence, we need to do this really right in the basics of OpenMP and MPI. So a CPMD is another parallel program. It's used usually for first principle based electronic structure and molecular dynamic simulations. Another one um, basically that is um, used is here the MP2C code, um, which is a hydrodynamics fluid simulation code um, used in end body um, simulations over time. Also here, the ideas about trajectories of atoms and molecules. And of course, um, it uses again the physics um, that we know already, the established laws of physics like Newton's equations of motion. We determine then, of course, the trajectories and given also then, of course, the force fields again with molecular mechanics is another part of it. Um, really to understand then, uh, again, a situation like here is a gas diffusion membrane. Um, and you see again the scaling here. If your number of nodes increase in one of the machines, you see that the runtime here, of course, um, basically then um, also increases just a little bit. But also here, of course, by using more nodes, 
we also here and there try to have a more realistic setup of this kind of particles in a fluid. Also there, this code is using, for instance, parallel I.O. with the so-called Xeonlib library. Uh, the details of that is not important, but it shows again the idea that not all of that is just computing-based parallelization, message exchanges with MPI. Often these codes also the, here and there benefit from parallel I.O. as we had in one of our earlier lectures. So also here, um, the idea really of understanding particle collisions, dynamics, and so on. This is kind of sort of a unique selling proposition from this MP2C, um, which is a not, or yet another molecular dynamics code um, that is basically on a mesoscopic scale of particles. And there we already introduced a little bit the point that some of those make, of course, sense also on different orders of scales, which I would like to summarize in the second part when we really talk about the material sciences as a whole to give a more broader picture, basically of all the different methods that are there. To finish the first part of the lecture here, um, let me just say that, of course, Ember, um, Namdi, Gromax is another one I don't really have presented, but is very often used as well, um, are all used in different areas of sciences. Ember, for instance, is really a big molecular dynamics suite of several programs um, that you can use, again, for also the energy and the force field. Um, it has this 3D domain decomposition that you know from earlier lectures is used as a parallel I.O. strategy based on net CDF that you already know. And of course, these days, Ember has been also GPU uh, enabled that you also see is, of course, also true for NAMD and Gromax and other players in the field. And you see a little bit how you here have the target size of atoms on the left hand side. Um, and then, of course, the number of GPUs on the X axis here and then shows you also how you come in terms of efficiency, um, basically to all these different codes. And you see some of them have really an interesting good behavior of efficiency versus not efficient behavior. And of course here, Ember and others can be used for many different um, you know, um, approaches. Ember, for instance, here is used to find an HEV1 in Greece enzyme. Um, that you basically uh, have as a, let's say, ingredient of understanding more the HIV-1 virus. Anyway, I think you got the story, basically, and I think the, the key idea here of the summary is to understand again, what is this idea of molecular dynamics now at all? So let us have a short video. In on molecular this. dynamics, atoms are typically represented as single point masses inside van der Waals potentials. And what were the 6, 12 potentials typically used to represent such things? This means that they come out mostly as hard spheres. Partial charges are then calculated via some form of quantum method to represent the distribution of electronic charge on those molecules. For a polar molecule like water, these partial charges can actually be quite large, with the best part of a full formal negative charge on the oxygen atom. In molecular dynamics, bonds are typically represented as simple harmonic oscillators, as are the angle constraints. To start the simulation, a range of velocities is chosen that matches the Boltzmann distribution for that temperature, and then those velocities are assigned randomly to each atom. Similar methods are then used to put energy into the bonds, angles, and dihedrals. The simulation is then run according to Newtonian physics with the molecules transferring both energy and momentum to one another via electrostatics and van der Waals interactions. So in these simulations, water is essentially a hard sphere with three point charges in it. Surprisingly, such a simple method for modeling these systems gives surprisingly good results on numerous physical properties that can be calculated. Maybe the best of these is the structure. So if we plot the average probability of finding an oxygen in a unit volume with distance out from a specific water molecule, we get what we would call a radial distribution function. Now it turns out these structural functions can actually be measured directly via experimental methods such as neutron scattering. As you can see, these very simple methods do a okay job of modeling the structure of water. Now we can also do this with other solutes in water. Say for instance, here we have pyridine in water, and the beauty of these molecular dynamic simulations is that we know everything about these systems. So here we can actually quite clearly see that the pyridines prefer to interact with each other in a T-type fashion. 
and with some extra poring over the data, we can work out how this would manifest itself in the experimental measurement. And this is the core of the work that we do. While molecular dynamics of relatively simple systems like water can be fairly successful, it really is the more complicated systems such as protein substrate interactions and how species translocate across membranes and so forth that are the real pertinent questions in biochemistry. And while the simulations are a fantastic way of getting insight into these problems and visualizing them, the answers that you get will only be as good as the parameterization of your model. It's garbage in, garbage out, and that's the ever-present caveat associated with molecular dynamics. Now, while molecular dynamics is a very solid player when it comes to gaining molecular insight into the behavior of such systems, it turns out that in many biological systems, the devil is in the detail. For instance, take a model system, guanodinium, an almost pervasive molecular motif. We know that real subtle changes in the guanodinium force field can change the form of the guanodinium-guanodinium cation-cation interaction from stacking to T-type. Now such problems may seem trivial until you realize the potential impact that such changes could have on the thousands of molecular dynamics studies done every year. The amino acid arginine is a key part in many voltage sensing channels, and it's been tied to important interactions in many protein-protein associations, and is doubtless an important interaction in determining protein folding pathways. The refinement of these details is critical to the development of this field. And this is the sort of work that we do in that with appropriate structural measurements, usually from neutron scattering, we can actually refine the details of the model and subsequently elucidate which are the important interactions that are critical in many biological systems. Okay, so that was a nice summary and you yeah, have seen water is in a way easy to um, you know, simulate, but of course here, if you want that, then a big simulation of water, the scale comes also into play. Um, and that brings us a little bit more to the broader subject of material sciences. So molecular systems are really a dive into some of these elements with you know, quantum chemistry already partly tackled. So let us review a little bit what this overall field entails. Again, here, of course, the kind of short disclaimer, if you are interested in computational you know, material sciences and engineering, uh, firstly, I would recommend this book that I hear really um, would put you to. It's a very nice tutorial, but secondly, you really need another course or courses really to become an expert here. This is just showing you um, a very nice idea of this model in simulation that by now you probably already understand, like the human brain model and then simulating the human brain with all the interaction is another story. Um, you have a kind of real behavior that you would like to approximate in a way and so you set up mathematical equations and quantify uh, quantities and so on that you basically try to solve for. But the simulations, of course, then are really, you know, having concrete input, having concrete constraints that then simulate real events based on this model. And of course, here is a simulation, as the word suggests, is not really reality. It's a, basically an approximation of the reality in many ways and more model of the reality. But it can gives us insights, of course, on different levels. And I think here the key message to take away on this material science and engineering and perhaps a bit broader, what I wanted to show you also when it has overlaps with systems biology, it has overlaps with computational fluid dynamics. You see here the different unit um, parts that you have, right? The human unit components, the whole complete structure, which is then on the length scale of 10 to the three meters, right? So here you would say structural mechanics is the way to go and the time scales. And then the opposite, as I said, atomic in the nanoscale or with molecular dynamics we already discussed, or even if you have this electronic orbitals, what I said, even go more deeper inside the atomic, then you're starting being on the level of quantum mechanics. And you see that in the end, to really understand those systems fully, um, we have to go between all these different scales, really, right, that you see here on the length scale, and then also thinking about the time scale is also a very important factor to understand, you know, certain behavior of these systems. So here are some examples, again, the nanometers of atoms versus a complete meter engineered structure here, or the femtoseconds of an atomic vibration that you see here, 
um, to the decades of use of product materials. You know, decades is here a little bit, you know, in terms of seconds, 10 to the 6, whatever you mean is a decade or even maybe many years, whatever, what you want to study. So this is, of course, something which is um, very blown in terms of computing. Hence, uh, material sciences is just yet another scientific case for HPC among many. And I would like to put you here also to this report as a pointer. If you're interested to be an application scientist after this course in terms of, you know, using HPC in different areas of sciences and engineering, this is a good point of understanding the scientific cases in astrophysics, climate, life sciences, things we already discussed, systems biology, molecular dynamics, molecular systems, life sciences as a whole, energy. Um, then we basically come to another field, which is, of course, this material sciences we have today. So you see, it's just one of many different fields. And next time, we will actually look more into the climate, weather, and earth sciences together. But let us stick a little bit now for, to this future of materials and from molecules to machines and products. And here, one example I brought you out of this is basically then the supercapacitors, um, where basically you want to understand the factors of this capacity problem that these devices usually have and how the charge is then built up. Because in a way, the supercapacitors are used in hybrid cars or Formula One cars here and there and could be used, of course, in normal vehicle types in the future. And to understand this better, you really want to, to use the supercapacitors instead of batteries, right? So to store energy for a short period of time, you really want to think about how we can make it better. It's in a way an engineering problem before we really engineer this particular supercapacitor in the way it, we engineer it in the computer. So we want to understand it first in the computer completely using rules of computational chemistry, materials design, um, which basically going beyond the supercapacitor, of course, have been always a traditionally large use of HPC worldwide in academia and industry. And will be probably in the future even much more when we have more details, more fine granular details discussed, or basically we also kind of think about even um, here and there having different of these models or so uh, combined in one. And it's a case I will do later. So <clears throat> then we talk about coupling, of course. Here again, now the center of excellences um, that I was, you know, promising uh, as another pointer really to think about. You see, there's a NOMAD, Novel Materials Discovery um, Center of Excellence, where all the experts in Europe across HPC in this particular area have been coming together. And here's an example of what they do. Um, they do develop usually new methods for new materials. And one of those new materials is hydrogen, as you probably know, uh, which could be a much more energy friendly and clean energy carrier um, that we basically maybe even use in aircraft in the future. But of course, today, um, several methods are unclear, like, for instance, this photocatalytic water splitting method that you see a little bit here, where you can use essentially then the sun here to, to get to this particular process of getting hydrogen or produce it really, literally. Um, but in the moment, the catalysts are not really clear or basically it's, there are certain limitations. So what we use HPC for here is to have better catalysts in the future for doing this water splitting that basically then has the potential to affect our hydrogen-based energy systems by orders of magnitude. And of course, in many related um, aspects like carbon dioxide management and so forth. So another pointer for you, a whole center of excellence with different codes, with different application areas, which really then enable the investigations with HPC of having high complexity systems, both in space and time. Then as a sort of other type of a COE, it is a max here. The flagship codes that this particular center of excellence provide is actually used in many different applications. They have scalable versions of quantum espresso, siesta, yambo, and so forth, and so forth. And you see, um, without going into all the details, obviously quantum espresso uses all we know already from the beginning of the lectures, MPI and OpenMP to make it parallel, to make it use on HPC. But you see here, that these are incredibly important codes for material sciences and they're used worldwide by different countries. And that's why, of course, the COE is also a point to make to really offering here scaling and also support for these particular packages. Also showing you again that, of course, many libraries already exist if you are in the field of material design. Also there, an interesting part is here and there, they also think about data analytics, so more data-oriented approaches 
also what we do in our race project that I was alluding to several times and also Reza already in his presentation, you know, having several engineering elements, which are not only thinking about the you know, physical equations or the known physical laws, but also AI, artificial intelligence or high performance data analytics methods. Now, when it comes to material sciences, um, which in the end is the modeling of the properties of materials and larger compounds, obviously, um, is often this up initio again that we were discussing before. So first principle based, um, there are lots of different methods and algorithms which really take these properties of the materials into account. And of course, for us as researchers, it's more and more interesting how we increase with the degree of complexity in all of these different materials sort of studies on graphene, for instance, a new material, so to speak, is interesting, but of course also to have a generally qualitatively understanding of all the processes that are actually going on in terms of materials or round materials. And of course here the ideas of predictive nature of the simulations, hopefully we can see how the um, basically material deteriorates maybe after 20 years and so on. A good overview also here as a pointer is really the US materials project. If you go to the website and there are YouTube actually tutorials available in YouTube, but also here you see they have several different tools to really do exploration of materials or better batteries as a very specific idea. Um, the visualize the stability, they have different tools available really that help you to understand that field and which are let's say enormous tools for researchers. And if you're seriously interested in studying this field, I would recommend you here in Iceland talk to Hannes Jonsson you see here on the left side and Egil Skulason on the right side, which are basically part of our simulation and data lab computational chemistry here in Iceland and really are experts in the field. Another one might be Elva Ern Jonsson, I left out a bit, but of course this is a lab of choice for those properties in computational chemistry related elements. So we do have lots of experts here. And I want to close a little bit with a motivating example towards Euclid, so long as it, it was alluding to you as a bit of a fun factor, maybe for those of you to really understand, you know, what it means to be at Euclid Salon. And here also to show, let's say, what we need in the future from these simulation techniques, because we think about coupling more these different scales that we mean. And if you think about what I said to you in the atomistic molecular dynamics domain, this is here the first principles based, really atomic. We know everything about these systems, but of course, computationally, they have a massive computational cost, right? So the, the more you go from the water that you see here, which looks beautiful, which is more in the computational fluid dynamics domain from Reza and so on. If you go to one of the really atomistic realistic simulations, you directly have to pay the price by much more computing power that needs to be done here. So we see there's a kind of, a uh, way of could you do it even in triple scale simulations where you basically have not the full blown atomistic scale, but something we call more or less coarse grained models with the blue spheres here in the middle in order to come to more computational fluid dynamics and, you know, continuum hydrodynamics really approach on the right hand side. Important to realize this by all if you do it in real, um, you know, solutions. If you want to model Utico Salon, you can imagine the boundary. The, the idea how you basically have this different glacier parts that are now basically in this lagoon, right? In this glacier lagoon of Euclid Salon in Iceland, data always plays an important role there as well, right? It's not only the laws of physics, also the idea how you position the particles, how you basically model the kind of area or the spatial really and temporal scales where you will simulate. Um, this all brings lots of things together. And you will couple them here perhaps in the future for much more realistic simulations where you zoom in, zoom out between different scales if you have extra scale performance. In an ideal situation, not forgetting that we still want to have here not a beautiful simulation that looks good, but an accurate simulation as best as possible approximating the reality. I will talk about this more also in short lecture 15 when we talk about coupling of so-called earth science code for water modeling, um, but this is something I do the next time. Hence, I would close here with the motivating example, perhaps to understand a little bit how actually different laws of physics are governing, you know, in, you know, the situation in Euclid Salon, that is really more or less uh, in a short video here as a motivator. Of course, here, there, you need also much more studying normally.
simulation. You see it is a bit older simulation, but that is the beauty of some of these simulations we do. Um, obviously, it's also not floating in the Caribbean, but here in Iceland, our Eucul Salon. But it gives you exactly the situation as we see it in the different laws of physics. We see structure of the material that you basically see then, of course, has interactions with all the atomic stick scale, really, if you want to do a more molecule eye on it. So that's all I wanted to leave on the table here for the short lecture 14, with having only the last application field the next time when we talk about lecture 15 and earth science examples of climate weather prediction and so forth. So talk to you then.